am Johnny Engineer Termel, and I'm on the 40th day, just finished, of my fast, with a few cheats in there, but I'm continuing on just to see how long I can make it last, because I haven't been hungry once. Lost 22 pounds, you know, two inches off my neck, four inches off my waist, haven't been weak, frail, or felt bad once. Gonna see how long I can keep going. But the point is, Jesus knew about urine therapy, and he could have pulled off a 40-day fast in the desert, too. Now, other incredible benefits of both urine and fasting coming up. Okay, so here I am after 40 days with no food, except for pizza, Chinese buffet, steak barbecue, uh, Polish wedding, a uh, plate of potato salad, and a uh, bowl of uh, Polish sauerkraut kapusta in 40 days. So not much cheating. But I've explained the advantages in my earlier videos, and especially how a starvation diet will reverse the cyclical AMPs and bring them back to normal in your cells to fight cancer. And how one fellow on a starvation diet eliminated his diabetes in 11 days. And another group of another all eliminated theirs in under eight weeks by a low calorie diet. And finally, how a starvation diet autolyzes or cannibalizes your bad cells first. So just a couple of clips out of the first video. More about starvation first before we get to the punchlines. <laughs> All right. Why fast? Part two about cancer. So instead of using medicine, rather fast the day. So basically, the most natural response of all animals when they're sick is to stop eating. Gee, that's pretty smart. When you think about it. How come we don't do that? <laughs> Ice cream, chocolate, please. I'm sick. So, normal cells go into survival mode during starvation, but cancer cells are always on. They can't go into starvation mode. There is no novel survival mode to switch on. So starvation-dependent stress protects normal cells, but not cancer cells. Even a modified alternate day of fasting with mice reduced proliferation rates of tumor cells. This 85% fasting regimen was even more effective than full 100%. Well, I don't know about that, but maybe who knows. And most recently, Longos uh, found that fasting both retarded the growth of tumors and nothing much more when, they, when you go into cannibalism mode, your body starts to do what's called autolysis, L-Y-S-I-S. -S. And that is the body cannibalizing its own cells. This is not autophagy that people have heard about where a cell, you know, eats up some bad stuff in the cell. This is the whole cell being eaten so that the other ones can survive. So, what do you think your body's going to choose to eat first? A brain cell or a fat cell? A fat cell. What do you think the body's going to choose to eat first and cannibalize first with autolysis? Heart cell, lung cell, or a tumor cell? Tumor cell. And they're the first to go. Which is why people on long fasts have managed to beat their cancers. Now we understand why that effect happens. There's the autolysis that destroys the tumors before any of the good stuff. Well, fat first, and I don't mind your fat going, but after that, tumors and other bad stuff. So that is the advantage of a long starvation diet. Okay, so now the good news is recent developments. Well, in my second video after 35 days, I mentioned how we had, they had, I found an article where they found DNA that is in our blood system that is not cannibalized when cells are destroyed, DNA roaming around that gets passed through the kidney barrier into the urine. But without all the dangerous products in the blood like HIV, because HIV can't live in urine, too potent and antiseptic, and other pathogens in blood that can't live in urine, too strong stuff. But of course, stem cells and DNA, they love it in there. So it's a nurturing, like amniotic fluid, actually. 
So that was the great discovery there that urine contains DNA as well as stem cells and vitamins and minerals and hormones and enzymes and a lot of the good stuff. So I ran across another article today which I thought was relevant dealing with cancer again. And uh, we're going to go into, it's called inflammation is the fuse that ignites cancer. Okay? So it seems that cancers arise where there's inflammation. And it's an article at invita.com slash cancer slash chronic hyphen inflammation question mark UTM underscore source equal tabula T-A-B-O-O-L-A. And it's got a great video explaining why this is happening. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, inflammation means I ignite. A microenvironment of chronic inflammation can increase the risk of cancer, bolster chemotherapy resistance, and turn on oncogenes that can turn cells into tumors. Inflammation promotes the spreading and mutating of cancer cells while continuing to push the mutations within the cancer cells' development. Inflammation also enhances tumors' ability to recruit blood supply, angiogenesis, and more. So, inflammation is one of the leading factors that contributes to uncontrolled growth of cancer cells and spreading metastasis. Okay, treating the cause of inflammation is a key, important, an important key when fighting cancer or chronic disease. So, what causes inflammation? Inflammation is the body's response to tissue damage. It, um, the response causes cellular changes and immune responses that result in repair and cellular proliferation, growth at the site of the injured tissue. When these inflammatory responses become chronic, cell mutation and proliferation can result, often creating an environment that is conducive to the development of cancer, the so-called perfect storm. So treating the inflammatory causes is always important. So most cancers have a cause, and those causes bring about chronic inflammation as part of the process. Changes catalyzed by pathogenic inflammation can transform cells into cancerous tumors. Several types of inflammation can promote cancer. Chronic inflammation plays a multifaceted role in carcinogenesis. So there are well-known examples they mention, and they say these infections bring about chronic inflammation as well. Abnormal body heat can also lead to thermogenesis and enhance metabolic spread of cancer during metastasis. Inflammation is known to cause other such changes in the microenvironment of cells. It's not enough to have a strategy to kill cancer cells. Chronic inflammation needs to be blocked and stopped at its roots to prevent the cancer from mutating and spreading. Many tumors occur in association with persistent inflammation. Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma unfolds on a background of chronic inflammation. One of the most highly expressed receptors is called epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR. And the greater the expression of EGFR means faster growth and enhanced spreading. The bottom line is inflammation can contribute to it. So it's also associated with increased chemotherapy resistance. So you combine chronic inflammation, you get a cancer that's immortalized. Treating a metastatic Metastatic cancer is impossible when ignoring the chronic inflammation at the cancer cell's metabolic core. There is no singular drug that can currently treat all these pathways, they say. How does inflammation occur? Well, lipoxygenase turns essential fatty acids into leukotriene in white blood cells to respond to trauma. And when they don't stop ringing the alarm bells, it leads to chronic inflammation. So they want to have lipoxygenase inhibitors to slow down cancer cells. So anyway, again, they mentioned the importance of inflammation pathways. And finally, when these pathways to inflammation are understood, it makes it that much easier to prevent cancer from growing, spreading. Cancer treatment as a whole involves strong, comprehensive, anti-inflammatory and signaling treatments. Treating inflammation is only one part, including nutrition, building the immune system. If you can slow down the growth of cancer, it makes it much easier to maintain and hopefully overcome. So, inflammation is the breeding ground and spreading ground of your cancers. Next clip, please.
Oh, final testimony. My mother, just before she died, had had a leg cut off from gangrene due to Raynaud's disease. And then her other one had now inflamed up to twice its size. And as a final resort, we stuck her on a urine fast. And after exactly five days, all the inflammation disappeared and she went back to normal. And then the doctor says the poison might have gone up her leg and killed her. So, you know, successful operation, lose the patient. But anyway, it worked for inflammation. Okay, so there it is. Wham! How did my mother's inflammation disappear completely after five days? Well, I'm going to take a few minutes now and read a few case histories out of John Armstrong's Water of Life. Okay? where he's talking about gangrene in particular, okay? And this is what took my mother. Come on, John, find it. There it is. The first case of gangrene, 1920. Uh, the patient was a lady of 53. Anemia had developed. The lungs shown signs of grave disturbance. And there was a gangrenous condition in one foot with a number of skin eruptions of varying dimensions on each leg. By dint of fasting the patient on her own urine and water and rubbing urine into her body and applying urine compresses, at the end of 10 days, the kidneys and bowels were working overtime. And though the eruptions had increased, they were less irritable. The breathing became normal and easy. The patient slept better and above all, the gangrenous foot began to show signs of healing. By the 18th day of the fast, the foot was quite normal. The urine had formed new skin, and there was no trace whatever of the livid abrasions. The foot had healed without even a scar. Yet, need we be surprised, once we understand that urine is not dead matter, but so to say flesh, blood, vital tissues, and living solution? Well, now we know it's stem cells and DNA, too. Okay, back to my mother. Now, what's this bit about and rubbing urine into her body when she's drinking it all? Well, when you're on a long fast, your body can't provide new vitamins, minerals, hormones, nutrients like that. So, John Armstrong used to have people massage healthy people's kidney milk into the recipient in order to provide the nutrition the body needed for the long fasts. And he found that by ow, two hours, three hours a day of body rubbing with fresh urine to get fresh good stuff into the body that needs it because your body can't just keep recycling your own over and over and over and over right? they get used up so you need new ones so i did that with my mother i massaged mine in and i you know uh you know and the best places are the face and the neck and the feet because it'll get absorbed faster and uh, she drank all of her own and at the same time I also used mine and I kept the compress on her full leg wrapped with like a woolen uh, you know shreds from a blanket and I kept it wet get up in the middle of the night warm some urine up and then you know take one of these um, gravy dippers and you know put it on her leg while she's sleeping to keep it moist and then five days later when we opened it up wham all that inflammation, and I, when I say twice as big, I mean four times the area. That's how that works. Back down to the little leg it used to be, okay? Inflammation fixed by five-day fast. Wow! Now, of course, like I said, the patient died because I didn't realize the poison would shoot north. But the point was, if inflammation is the source and the breeding ground for cancers, and a five-day fast can get rid of a huge inflammation caused by gangrene. Wow! How many people can't do that? Give that a try. Okay, so, and he's got many more cases of actually curing gangrene from people who've been advised to chop off their limbs. And, of course, the best example was the lady who had it in the foot and eventually saved her foot and it went back to normal, like my mother's. So, that means that urine and fasting not only have an effect on the autolysis of the cell, the cannibalization, the cannibalization of the cells to kill the bad ones and the tumors first, but we also have 
this wonderful new angle that the water of life can provide us, the sustenance, and uh, what can I say? If it can get rid of the inflammation, you have to ask yourself, how did it do that? Inflammation can't disappear if the cause didn't disappear, right? And that means that urine therapy gets to the cause and eliminates the cause. Wow! All right. Now, final point about the 40-day fast. We all know the story about Jesus going off into the desert and some say he fasted, some say he didn't, whatever. But the point is, if he knew what I knew about urine therapy sustaining himself, he could have gone out in the desert, especially if he was a little overweight, you know. After, they called Jesus and his followers drunkards and gluttons, so they were rich and had a party lifestyle, so he may have needed to lose a few pounds before the coronation, you know, the crown prince, because this book, Jesus Lived in India, has a fascinating argument that the lost years of Jesus, between 12 years old and 30, when he hit the news again, were spent in India being educated as the crown prince of the Jews. Now, does that make more sense that, let's remember now, the Magi came by, this caravan of rich dudes, and gave them a whole bunch of gold and frankincense and myrrh in days of 38% interest rates on your trust fund. You really think Jesus was banging, you know, wheels in the carpentry shop? Or could he have been off on a foreign education and come back as a tecton, an engineer, a civil engineer, who knows how much more, like Joseph, his father? So... The book, Jesus in India, by Holger Kirsten, ISBN 0906540909, says there are 21 documents in the India attesting to this remarkable man. Now, he went to the schools where they were trained in the medicinal use of cow urine, because cow urine is supposed to be spectacularly good stuff. So much so, it's commercially marketed now in India. And like I joked in that first video, I wish we'd do that too. So, again, there's something special about cow urine, but here's my point. If he knew about cow urine, then he certainly knew about the beneficial, powerful effects of his own urine. So he could have come back, you know, and coronations like 40 days away and says, I'm going to go out and really impress you boys and stick it out in the desert, you know, and no food for 40 days, but he knows how to do it. Come back fit and slim and trim in time for the coronation. Come on now. Easily done. I had my four feasts and couple of nibbles, but I'm going on. I want to see if I can crack the 49 days that he, his second longest record, he claims 101, and I don't doubt him. So, but he had now... The tough part is if you got a cancer or you've got a real serious problem and you need a really, really long fast, who are you going to find to massage the necessary healthy urine into your body while you do that? That's going to have to get organized pretty soon. You know, can't always be your loved ones and there could be a good, you know, career in it, you know, especially if you got healthy urine. So that's my post on why i believe jesus could have easily pulled off the 40 days in the desert with no food because i could have and i think that anybody could if they're armed with this incredible knowledge about the powerful nutritional benefits of kidney milk and take advantage of it final point just in case this urine fast may turn out to be able to cut my food intake by 50 percent 60 who knows what i'm going to do is when i finally do get hungry and eat something i'm then going to stay on my fast and not eat again until i'm hungry and then stay on my fat and just see what happens i mean how little can i survive on if i'm getting all my kidney milk miracle stem cell dna water recycled back in could I live on 20% of my normal dietary regimen? Could a urine fast on a regular basis be a solution to world hunger? Well, let's see how long I can last and then what happens after I start eating more regularly.